Welcome, friends, to this uh, free final presentation on the 11th day of what has been truly a tour de force, 11 days of webinars and presentations on global unity. This has been an extraordinary experience for the many around the world who followed, no doubt, because it show, showcased what can be described as truly a movement of all movements. A directory of partner organizations and networks of committed individuals and groups and communities that are all working on different aspects of peace. So it is our great joy on this final day, which also happens to be the UN International Day of Peace to engage you on the topic of unity steps to peace. This is a very important question, it seems, especially as we heard these powerful presentations on the full range of topics that we, the world, is committed to from unity to interdependence, environment, economic justice, health, children and youth, women, human rights, freedom, disarmament, and of course, finally, peace. We have to ask ourselves the question, what is the common systemic foundation of all these vast efforts? In order for these vast efforts to be able to come together, and to truly scale their impact, what is it that unites them? If we can understand that, if we can take a principled approach of what unites all these 11 initiatives through these 11 days and actually throughout the year, then we can become even more systematic in our collective approach. And that is what we hope to focus on before the end of this uh, these 11 days and before the end of the UN uh, International Day of Peace. We would like to take today a principled approach because we are convinced that in order to be able to scale the efforts of all these organizations to come to, a, to truly a global impact, a transformative global impact, to come to an ability to really shift our pretty disturbing current condition, we have to become very clear about what are the underlying spiritual principles that unite the efforts that range widely from economic justice to disarmament to freedom, etc. This is a very interesting point in history. As all of these organizations and speakers made clear, we realize that we have already left home. There's no going back. That's something that humanity got awakened to with the pandemic in the last year. We all realized that there's no going back to the pre-pandemic world. The question though is, what is the map forward? And this is what I described in my book, Global Unitive Healing, as this perilous journey to common ground that we're in now. In order to understand, to come to this common ground, we have to really understand what are the spiritual principles that unite us and how can we use these spiritual principles to address the steep challenge to our current condition. We need a common language, a common discourse and a common map in order to have unity of thought, unity of vision, and unity of action in order to really scale our impact. I would like to suggest today that such a common language has already emerged, that an evolutionary universal spiritual language first emerged amidst an unsuspecting humanity in the middle of the 19th century in the Middle East. The Baha'i spiritual system released on the scene of collective consciousness 
a new spiritual language which integrated the wisdom of the East with the wisdom of the West, deep spiritual, cultural, and historic rootedness, profound traumatization, along with the modern needs of a global age. And it offered a credible map, a credible map which, believe it or not, in the mid 19th century was already addressing in a principled spiritual language, every one of the 11 topics that these 11 days of global unity were dedicated to. Certainly the question of our interdependence, of our relationship to the environment and sustainability, economic justice, women, children, youth, human rights, freedom, disarmament, all of these are questions that are addressed by this profound spiritual system. And I'd like to share what are some of these principles that are put forth in a spirit of sharing wisdom, which is available for all of us and which in some ways we're already drawing on, um, whether we are aware of it or not. And in other ways, it still has a lot that we can draw and learn from it. So uh, this map, this spiritual map, looks at our current condition, our modern condition, and recognizes the deepest reason for our contemporary suffering as our very divided understanding of life on this planet. And it's interesting because divisiveness has only deepened since the mid 19th century. We now live at a time where religious, political, social ideologies are clashing and contending on every level, including on the level of global health. Um, and so divisiveness is deepening and it's making it very difficult for us to have a collective vision and to channel and to streamline our efforts. And oftentimes, even when we try to address issues around environmental sustainability and planetary sustainability or issues around economic justice or human rights or freedom, our discourse still tends to be somewhat divisive. And so it is quite difficult still for us to overcome this deep tendency and to move towards a discourse that is elevating, spiritual, that inspires, that brings people together and does not uh, use oppositional contentiousness. A spiritual principle that was also identified in this uh, uh, spiritual system, this Baha'i spiritual system, is that human consciousness evolves just as our spiritual understanding evolves. And that human consciousness is, is now at an evolutionary cusp. We have organized life on this planet in ways that have been characterized by very um, limited interests. It was the family, the clan, the city state. Now it's the nations. And it's becoming increasingly apparent that we have to emerge beyond that into thinking collectively about the planet we share, which is a huge evolutionary leap. And this evolution is, of course, quite painstaking, but it is a fundamental premise of the spiritual system. And it is very consistent with earlier spiritual systems that for us to make that leap, to successfully evolve towards planetary consciousness and a planetary organization of life that is sustainable and increasingly just and united, key to, key to our ability to carry out this leap is the recognition of the unitary nature of reality. So for many centuries now, um, as we know from uh, individual and lifespan development, individuals evolve from very concrete thinking into abstract and eventually are able to grasp 
principles. And even as we grasp principles, our ability to, to see that which is not tangible is um, a capacity that evolves. Right now, we're challenged to recognize the unitary nature of reality. This split that we still carry between material and spiritual reality, the way that we focus primarily on material aspects and concrete social aspects of life and really speak about the spiritual uh, energies and, and forces behind that as a luxury, sort of as a side note, uh, reveals how much growth is still in front of us. What does this mean? Of course, we know that uh, quantum physicists in the last hundred years have consistently been coming to this understanding, starting with Erwin Schrodinger and then Max Planck, David Bohm, and of course, many others, aside from quantum physicists, have recognized that reality is unitary, non-material. Essentially, it is consciousness, which manifests in material and social realities. And if we truly grasp this, which is a leap, a developmental leap, then we begin to realize that the attitude, the spirit in which things are done makes all the difference. An oppositional spirit, a contentious spirit cannot bring peace. It cannot bring resolution of our collective global problems. So um, our means are just as important as our ends. In fact, there was a very interesting discussion on uh, freedom um, a, a couple days ago. The topic of that webinar was facing the crisis of freedom and democracy. And uh, I was very appreciative to hear the context in which Rabbi Michael Lerner and Peter Gabel talked about this crisis. They pointed out to the fact that progressive, uh, liberal-minded, left, perhaps we can say, oriented people worldwide, and certainly in the US, are so focused on the material and the concrete expressions of justice um, and equality that they forget to speak to the spiritual nature, to the spiritual longings and to the spiritual reality of people. And in a way, unwittingly leave people then prey to uh, religious ideologies. And I'd like to quote what Michael Lerner and Peter Gabel said. Michael Lerner said, the way to build a successful global movement is by affirming the spiritual dimension of reality. He said, we have to move from a laundry list of demands to larger value system. We have to affirm the possibility of possibility. That was the approach that the Baha'i uh, spiritual system put forth for humanity really at a time that was quite unsuspecting of what was emerging. Uh, Peter Gabel put it slightly differently, but I think equally helpfully, he says action at this critical point is actually changing the frame of thinking. Learning how to articulate progressive social policies in a way that reflects the desire of all people to live in a more spiritual, whole, and more fulfilling world. So this is a wonderful expression of the fact that when universal spiritual principles are articulated, eventually they penetrate collective consciousness and we're all reaching these conclusions, whether we realize that these principles were articulated long ago or not. In, uh, in my book, Global Unity Healing, I try to show this journey of discovery through the lives of ordinary people who, for different reasons, come to realize that they have to reach deep within for the courage to redefine inherited inner and outer truth claims. Life after life, I describe how people begin to develop a new spiritual alphabet, often quite unsuspecting of what's already out there, because they realize 
that the, the language they have internalized is profoundly oppressive, profoundly divisive, and it does not work. And when people set out on this journey, they begin to realize that this new spiritual alphabet is really an alphabet in which each letter is um, an evolutionary spiritual principle. This understanding is emerging part as, as part of our social evolution. We are realizing increasingly that unity in our diversity is actually completely possible, not only possible, but truly the only way forward, the only sustainable way forward. So when we come from this principled understanding of the unitary nature of reality, then we understand the problems of a modern age, everything from human rights to economic justice, to freedom, to disarmament, from a principled perspective of the unity of scientific rationality and spiritual wisdom. We realize that not only do we have to draw on both, but they have to inform equally every decision for policy decisions to work, to really work in the world. And that was another spiritual principle that was articulated 170 years ago. The essential unity of science and religion because they describe through different methods, a unity of reality. And so we are coming to that, but it has to be more intentionally espoused in all of our reflect, uh, um, respective initiatives. Probably the most revolutionary aspect that this way of unity, as I describe it in my book, um, revealed as a methodology for an era in which humanity has to come together in order to survive. The most revolutionary aspect of this methodology of the way of unity is the concept of consultation. Consultative processes and the development of consultative skills on every level, from individuals to families, to communities, to cities, to nations, and to the planetary community. Now, consultation is a very challenging principle and one in which we are yet to become truly skillful, all of us. And that involves intentionality in really um, cultivating the skill of consultation because it's not a model we have, it's not something we witness, it's not something we fully understand. Here, I would like to actually offer you a very brief excerpt from a talk which was given in 1912 by Abdul Baha in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And I'd like to explain who Abdul Baha is. Abdul Baha was the son of the founder of the Baha'i spiritual system. And he is increasingly widely recognized as the first global peace ambassador. This was a man who spent his whole lifetime imprisoned and persecuted for this revolutionary spiritual belief system that he espoused and embodied in his life. And when he was finally freed from uh, uh, 1911 to 1913, he traveled from Palestine all the way into the West and across the whole United States and gave talks in so many churches, synagogues, universities, and public spaces that to this day, there are detailed uh, records of all of his talks and visits and many newspaper articles of how this first truly universal human spoke to an unsuspecting humanity just before the First World War about what it means to embrace global peace, the unitive steps, the concrete steps that are involved, and, and what are the kind of challenges that that implies for each one of us. And here's how he describes consultation. I'm going to read you just a brief excerpt from, uh, from my book. Consultation is of vital importance, but spiritual conference 
and not the mere voicing of personal views is intended. In France, he, he says, I was present at a session of the Senate, but the experience was not impressive. Parliamentary procedures should have for its object the attainment of the light of truth upon questions presented and not furnish a battleground for opposition and self-opinion. And further, he says, it was not consultation, but comedy. Consultation must have as its object the investigation of truth. He who expresses an opinion should set it forward as a contribution to the consensus. Before expressing his own views, he should carefully consider the views already advanced by others. True consultation is a spiritual conference in the attitude and atmosphere of love. So as we reflect on what that might actually look like, we realize that many of our discussions still boil down to sharing personal opinions, to engage into a real organic consultative process where the organic solutions and decisions that emerge do not belong to any one person, any one organization, any one entity, but really belong organically to the whole. That is a level of skill which we are yet to develop but that is a fundamental unitive skill if we are to move towards global peace. In order to become skillful in this practice and really able to overcome polarizing contentiousness, there is a whole other set of integral skills that are also uh, very um, in-depth described by the spiritual system as they are by other spiritual systems. And that is, the idea of a spiritual ethic. But in, in this case, with this spiritual, with the Baha'i spiritual system, uh, the focus is on an evolutionary spiritual ethic for the individual. So we, the point being that we need a whole new set of skills to deal with the global age as individuals. Skills that may not have been necessary when we lived in small um, communities but that are really necessary in this age. And especially in an age where there is such a profound lack of character, lack of integrity, lack of virtue in the public space. It is essential for us in this age to cultivate intentionally and to educate towards spiritual susceptibilities, coherence of mind and heart, wholeness and constructive resilience. These are aspects of an evolutionary spiritual ethic that were articulated at great length. In a more contemporary time, philosopher Ken Wilber describes this as the six aspects of, of wholeness that he speaks of, and those are waking up, growing up, cleaning up, opening up, linking up, and lifting up. These are all aspects of an evolutionary spiritual ethic of the individual that then will also allow us to begin to raise an evolutionary spiritual ethic for society as well. Because without such a collective societal ethic, how can we possibly grow beyond disunity and move towards uh, the unity of the planet? Now, it is interesting that exactly a hundred years after the passing of the founder of the Baha'i spiritual system, the Parliament of World Religions released a profound statement called Towards a Global Ethic. This is about 20 years ago, the recognition was collectively arrived at by the representatives of the world spiritual systems that we need a universal collective global ethic that will unite our efforts. And that ethic has to be clearly articulated and embraced and intentionally held as a guiding light, as an orientation in all of our efforts. 
Now the challenge of course, and we're still facing this challenge, is to move beyond statements into the reality of embracing that ethic. And that of course means again, developing unity skills. And also developing a unity view of religion and spirituality. And that was another spiritual principle that was articulated in the Baha'i spiritual system that in fact, religion evolves. Religion evolves, spirituality evolves. And so there is really no room for contentiousness between the different spiritual systems because we are all part of the spiritual evolution of humanity and our core is common and that's what counts. And also we're all oriented towards this evolution. And to the extent that that is embraced, we're able to truly work together collaboratively and move from statements to the development of real skills, unitive skills. Just a few decades after this principle was first articulated in the Middle East, in the Far East, Sri Aurobindo described the same thing as he basically wrote that different religions are context-specific expressions of the universal truth consciousness. So we can see again and again how these spiritual principles get discovered and articulated again and again in these 11 days manifested that very clearly. And the point of our discussion today is that there is yet a new step to be made from recognizing how we're all awakening to these spiritual principles to actually embracing them intentionally and developing the skills to act out of these principles. That is a whole new step. And that is what will allow us to take the evolutionary leap of our collective civilization that is in front of us. We have emerged from systems of oppression to in the last few centuries, a progressively comprehensive struggle for liberty, for human liberty. What's in front of us now though, is to move from our current rather individual understanding of liberty to a mature grasp of freedom as interdependence and working cooperatively and collaboratively to protect sustainable planetary life. So this is a whole developmental redefinition of liberty as the, the liberty, the freedom to work together for a planet that we can actually leave to our grandchildren. And that such work, and that is yet another spiritual principle that has to be remembered and skillfully used, such work in order for it to be effective has to always represent a unity of the value spheres. What does that mean? It has to bring together the true, the good and the beautiful. If our struggle for freedom, if our struggle for human rights is violent, if it is contentious and oppositional, it may be upholding a truth, but is it truly good and is it truly beautiful? And what skills will help us carry forth these very, very challenging endeavors in front of us in a truly unitive spirit. I will stop here. Thank you. And we will now have an opportunity to hear from Bob Atkinson some very compelling examples of how the global Baha'i community is trying to resolve these challenges and to develop this skillfulness. Thanks very much, Elena. <clears throat> so from this um, look at global unit of healing and the way of unity, we can see that an evolutionary, <clears throat> excuse me, an evolutionary process has brought humanity to where world peace is the next step in a developmental process toward our collective maturity. We live in a time when it has become necessary to recognize that all things are interconnected in a greater whole. Circles of unity, as Elena mentioned, have evolved and expanded from family to clan, to city state, to nations. And now 
we're on the verge of realizing world unity as one human family. We're really pleased to be able to focus during this International Day of Peace on the Baha'i concept of peace, not only because this is probably the least well-known of the world's spiritual traditions, but also because this worldwide faith community came into being in the mid 1800s with the objective of attaining world peace. All world, spirit, all world spiritual traditions anticipate a time of peace on earth. While the conditions for this have not yet been suitable, we now live in that time when world peace is not only possible, but necessary. The framework for the attainment of world peace is found in a set of spiritual principles designed specifically to bring that about, which I'll get to in a minute. We also want to tell you a little later about uh, One Planet Peace Forum, which is having its second annual gathering this weekend. But first, the Baha'i concept of peace recognizes world peace as the culmination of the evolution of human consciousness. And I'd like to offer a brief look at some of the unitive steps needed to move toward world peace. Every spiritual epic has its own 10 commandments or beatitudes <clears throat> that characterize the essence of spiritual truth for that time or the spirit of that age. Now, with world peace as the vision and goal for our time, the foundational principle needed to live by is the oneness of humanity. The recognition of this truth is actually the starting point for the journey of realizing peace and order in the world. For this principle to be achieved, a supporting framework of unifying principles that contribute to building world unity is also needed. And those are equality between women and men, balance between wealth and poverty, harmony between science and spirituality, freedom from all forms of prejudice, justice that is unitive, not punitive, truth that is independently discovered, education that is universal, and nature that is protected as a divine trust. In the Baha'i writings, peace is seen as the supreme goal of all mankind and as an evolutionary process achieved through steps and stages with many stepping stones along the way. Each of the unifying principles just mentioned are all necessary stepping stones toward peace and are so interdependently tied together that the realization of one depends on the realization of all the others. Each one is a prerequisite for humanity to live as one in peace. One of the final stepping stones is for world peace is world unity. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith in the mid 1800s said, the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly, firmly established. So the achievement of peace is dependent upon the establishment of unity and justice. Peace is understood as a collective state of being manifesting unity. Of course, this needs to be reflected on the individual level as this is the only thing that will restructure relationships on all levels. Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, expounded upon his father's panoramic vision in talks across Europe and America in 1911 and 1913, offering a holistic, all-inclusive vision for global peace. One of the topics he spoke on was the lights or various realms of unity needed 
to achieve unity on the level of the entire human family. These are also requisites to world peace. He said, the first candle is unity in the political realm, the early glimmerings of which can now be discerned. The second candle is unity of thought in world undertakings, which will ere long be witnessed. The third candle is unity and freedom, which will surely come to pass. The fourth candle is unity in religion, which by the power of God will be revealed in all its splendor. The fifth candle is the unity of nations, which in this century will be securely established. That was written in the early 19th century, the early 20th century which will cause all peoples to regard themselves as citizens of one common land. The sixth candle is unity of races, making all that dwell on earth peoples and kindreds of one race. The seventh candle is unity of language, the choice of a universal tongue in which all peoples will converse. So each of these seven lights will come to pass, Abdullah said, with the aid of forces beyond us. In, 1890, in, in 1985, the Universal House of Justice, the international governing body of the Baha'i world community, re <clears throat> released a statement addressed to the peoples of the world called the promise of world peace. They asserted, quote, the great peace towards which people of goodwill throughout the centuries have inclined their hearts, of which seers and poets for countless generations have expressed their vision, and for which from age to age, the sacred scriptures of mankind have constantly held the promise is now at long last within the reach of the nations. World peace is not only possible, but inevitable. It, it is the next stage in the evolution of this planet. Far from meaning that we can sit back and watch this happen, this view renews hope, affirms the eventual outcome, acknowledges a purpose to these turbulent times, and raises a call to action. Because the way we get to this desired outcome is dependent upon all of us. With this, with this vision of the future, we all have a proactive responsibility in making sure the transformational process we are in the midst of is a gentle as possible rebirth of the planet. So this vision of peace on earth has been unfolding in stages toward unity on the widest and most inclusive levels. There's just too much to go into right now about how this will happen, what a detailed blueprint for world peace might look like. But from a big picture perspective, peace will emerge in the world through the operation of two interconnected processes. First, through the evolution of a unitive consciousness, comprising the application of the principle of the oneness of humanity and the unity of nations. Second, through the establishment of the means for international collective security and an equitable and just system of global governance that will foster world unity. For anyone interested in going into this in more depth, I would recommend exploring the Baha'i Chair for World Peace website, which is at the University of Maryland, and a new book written by Huda Mamouni, the current holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, as well as the comprehensive website, baha'i.org. I'd like to just 
say a little bit now about One Planet Peace Forum, which is presenting a free virtual gathering designed to cultivate a culture of peace this weekend, Friday the 24th through Sunday the 26th, from 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time each day. One Planet Peace Forum was created as an annual event to offer a universal platform for people of all spiritual and secular expressions to co-create solutions to humanity's most challenging issues. Before I say any more about this year's program, if I can get the screen share to work, I would like to share a short clip about Sarah Farmer, who was the inspiration for One Planet Peace Forum, as she raised the first known peace flag in 1894. Just one second here. I get this. On August 17th, Abdul Baha arrived in Elliott, May at Greenacre a conference center founded by Sarah Farmer to bring together people of diverse backgrounds and points of view. Sarah was the daughter of electrical genius Moses Garish Farmer and humanitarian Hannah Shapley Farmer, who established a residence for poor women and their children. Their home had been a way station on the Underground Railroad, and they knew Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and other reformers. In 1893, at the World's Parliament of Religions, Sarah invited Swami Vivekananda and Dharma Pala to speak at Greenacre for social reformers, educators, artists, scientists, religious seekers, and philosophers met to share ideas. The following year, Sarah dedicated Greenacre to the ideals of peace and unity and had the first known peace flag raised. Greenacre emerged as a center, if not the very heart, of liberal religion in the United States. So that is where the idea for One Planet Peace Forum came from. It goes back to very early tradition in New England of peace building by, in Sarah Farmer's case, creating a universal platform to bring people of all backgrounds together, like Swami Vivekananda and so many others. So with a holistic approach to peacemaking, One Planet Peace, Fall, peace Forum follows upon the peace movement, nuclear disarmament, civil rights, social, racial, economic, and environmental justice, all of which are critical components and, of, and stepping stones toward world peace. Within this inclusive framework, One Planet Peace Forum invites people from all backgrounds to gather to reflect on how we can build bridges that will unite the human family. This year's program, which is our second annual, and we're hoping that we can have our third annual next year at Greenacre, but this year's speakers include Audrey Kitagawa, founder of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation, Anin Khalid, a Youth Obama Foundation scholar, Kurt Johnson, author of the Coming Inner Spiritual Age, Zia Bastida, a climate justice activist, Swami Tayagananda of the Vedanta Society of Boston, Phil Goldberg, author of Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, Dot Maver, the National Peace Academy, 
Joe Weston, a fierce civility project, John Luke McLean, a youth peace builder, Robert Shetterly, painter and founder of Americans Who Tell the Truth, Chloe Maxman, environmental activist, Peter Blaze Cochran of Unity Earth and Purpose Earth, and Francisco Morales, URI Global Trustee. So we would really love to have all of you that are uh, hearing this uh, register for this Peace Forum. And I have one other thing to share if I can get this up for a second. This, um, this has all the information on the website, oneplanetpeaceforum.org slash register. Go there, find out all um, more about it. All the, read all the speakers' bios and the whole program. And we look forward to seeing you this weekend at the One Planet Peace Forum. I think we've got um, some time left for conversation or discussion. Do you have any, anything that came in through chat or otherwise? Yes, we needed to announce earlier, we omitted to announce earlier that if you have questions at this time, you're welcome to sh uh, share them in the chat room and we will try to address them comments, reactions. Uh, Donald Pett from Peace Academy, raised hand. Okay. There's some lovely comments, thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Donald. Hi, Hi Donald. Hi. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, by the way. But uh, what do you think the next step is? Um, I'm looking at what are the practical, you know, there's a lot of um, what things ought to be done and a lot of, a lot of voices talking about the goals and so on. But the question I'm raising to you, have you given much thought? I'm sure you have. What is the next step? Is it getting people together in meetings, large conferences, or I'm thinking of the possibility of Zoom that raises the possibility of worldwide education at very, at very low expense? Or, you know, I think Einstein's idea was that we have to create a new vocabulary that changes the way people think that the, yeah. as long as we think of have tribal love and tribal thinking, Mm -hmm. And we're stuck there. So I wonder if you would like to share any of your thoughts about that. I think that uh, I will jump in to uh, what you quoted as Einstein's idea about a new vocabulary. Uh, this is something I, I wrote extensively about in Global Unity of Healing. We need a new evolutionary spiritual language. That language has already emerged, but it's not cultivated. We really need to cultivate an evolutionary spiritual language that connects us, that really speaks out of our unity, that really speaks out of the spiritual nature of reality. And this language is a, is a form of re-education because we have all internalized languages of contention and oppression. And so without this new language, um, even our most well-intended efforts often tend to... Um, to fluctuate greatly in, in terms of impact. And I think you mentioned earlier, uh, Donald, that we do have this fairly inexpensive Zoom forum opportunity for education, education of ourselves and of collective humanity in a way of speaking and relating to each other, which is spiritual, which is mutually uplifting, and which is also consultative. So I think that it's very practical and very concrete for us to move towards forums, most likely Zoom forums, that open space to take up a concrete issue on any level and really consult, which is different than the panels we usually have where each panelist will, will put forth their position, will in a way advertise their work, 
the organization that they uh, work from, a consultative process where the goal is to let an organic decision emerge. Something that we're all gonna be learners in, but in modeling this learning process, we have a much greater chance of hoping that others will engage in that process too. So to me, the next step is definitely a re-education of ourselves in um, a collective spiritual language that emphasizes our oneness, our interdependence, that genuinely recognizes the spiritual consciousness-based nature of reality, and using this language in consultative forums that try to address specific issues by evolving organic solutions that don't belong to anybody, not any individual. Those are first thoughts, but uh, it's an excellent question. What are the next steps? I mean, according to the climate report, we really have nine years. This is not a long time. Next steps have to be imminent, not just presentations, consultation. Yeah, I would just add to that really important point about the about the need for a new language. <clears throat> that is so critical. And the, th the thing is, as Lane was alluding to, is that it's it's here. We're just not aware of it. We're not using it as much as we should. So it's a it is a language um, that also has that can be characterized in the same way. Um, the uh, the spiritual teachings of our time can be characterized. And so the language of our time is really a language of inclusive, in inclusivity, a language of wholeness, a language of unity. And anything that um, is not that remains the old language that has um, passed its, long past its prime, and needs to be replaced by this language of inclusivity and wholeness. And so that's gonna take uh, a lot of practice on all of our parts to, to use it, to become familiar with it, to make it, to make it, um, to make the way we express ourselves in every situation that we're in, whether it's in, in person in groups or on Zoom, where it might be, it takes practice to become accustomed to speaking in that language. It's like any other new language that has to be learned. And, and when we do that, that will be a really good sign that we're also moving out of what I might refer to as a, as a adolescent consciousness and moving toward a consciousness of maturity or a consciousness of, of wholeness. So that's the process that we're in the midst of. And yeah, now with the, with the conditions that we're living in, we can try to apply all of that to uh, all the, uh, the many Zoom meetings that we find ourselves in. And then once we get beyond that to all of the uh, in-person gatherings that we're in as well, just, um, I mean, I, I cannot, I, we, we, uh, maybe we can actually identify that as a call to action from this from this um, presentation, which would be learn and use the language of inclusivity in all things we think and do. And I will add to that, learn and use the language of inclusivity, consultative orientation, and organic decision-making, organic collective connected decision making. So thank you, Donald, for an excellent question. We're coming to the close of our presentation today. I do not see any further questions. Want to give one more opportunity if there are any further questions. If not, we'd like to end with a musical piece. We seem to be okay and we'll be able to and uh, on time with a lovely musical pr presentation 
as we move towards the close, the last event that will close the 11 days of uh, peace. All right, bear with me. I'm going to be sharing screen now. Elena, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Would you take a few minutes? Uh, just give me a moment here to stop sharing screen. And uh, yes, we are well within time. So if there's something that needs to be shared, did you want to share something, Donald? I would love to. Please. Yeah, I, by the way, I thought everything you said was right on, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the nonprofit that I founded 10 years ago 
and been working on some things along the lines that you and and, and, uh, and Bob Atkinson were saying. Uh, a couple of things. We've created a vocabulary of over 100 words, uh, a lot of new words and some updates of older words that change the way people think very rapidly from either or to both end way of looking at the world. Uh, and, you know, but, so we've kind of identified that I think what Einstein was trying to tell us is that the reason we have our, all of our problems is because for over billions of years, we've had to think in terms of two categories, the, my tribe's way and the, uh, the opposite side's way, both competing for food and limited resources. So if we can, so Einstein, I think he said, the one way we can change is to create a new vocabulary. So we've been working on that. And we've created a lot of these new words. Uh, just as an example, uh, the word cerebral cortex, which is a commonly used that our ancestors created, we've used the word genie organ instead. Uh, you, really, you know the story of Aladdin's lamp. You free the genie from the bottle and you're granted three wishes. You know, if we think if we think of the of our of our brain as a genie organ, it says that we have the ability to solve complex problems and grant wishes, unlimited wishes, not just three. The other thing is we've created a new method of education, which was just the the name Genie Seminar. Genie Seminar was approved by the United States Trademark and Patent Office. So uh, our goal would be to start a movement of a million such. Uh, groups around the world, the, the same way that the two alcoholic men started AA around the world. And it's, it's a good role model, I think, of an example of how just a couple of people can get something happening very quickly. And I think your, your, your estimate of nine, we have nine years is generous. Uh, um, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, 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 the book, The World at Risk, that was a survey that was authorized by the U.S. Joint Congress. They interviewed over 250 of the world's experts on nuclear weapons and, and nuclear power. And the, the book was actually the report to our president, to uh, President Obama. And it basically said that, the, that we have very limited time. Uh, I think, according to the book, probably another six or seven years. I, this was written about three or four years ago. And they said we had a maximum of 10 years. So nine years would be a little generous. So I just, if, if it's agreeable with you, I'll, I'll send you a copy of the vocabulary we've created and uh, a little description of the new method of education. Uh, maybe you'd find it interesting. And uh, I'd, I'd like to just uh, uh, maybe hear some something more about what you've been doing if you have a, uh, do you have any talks or anything there on the internet? Internet. Well, we can we can share this information gladly, Donald, and please do share this vocabulary that you have developed. Um, I noticed as you were speaking about this initiative that there was actually a question directed at us: What are some ways of cultivating a spiritual language? So, of course, the example that you gave is one example. Actually, developing a new vocabulary—that's one way to go about it. I think that different groups will come up with somewhat different ways, but ultimately the intention converges here. Um, for me, when I think about cultivating a spiritual language, I think about um, orienting ourselves to the spiritual essence of things as we speak and to the spiritual essence of the people across from us, speaking to the soul speaking from the soul and trying to speak about what is at the core, at the spiritual core of uh, whatever the issue that we're contending with. To me, this focus on spiritual uh, essential realities and spiritual principles is part of cultivating a spiritual language. Sometimes we may have to replace words um, or create new words. Um, we have to be open to all possibilities. But I think also in each wisdom tradition, there is a lot of richness. Of course, we have in the Judaic, uh, in the Jewish tradition, 
the concept of I thou turning to everything as a thou and speaking as a thou and viewing it as a thou. Uh, that's already such a shift in mindset just right there. So there's probably this, this is a conversation to be continued. We are moving towards the end of this program because there will be a closing program starting at eight o'clock. And uh, we were kindly asked to, to give all the participants time to catch their breaths before the closing program at eight. So um, I'd like to suggest that we move towards closing. Is there anything you'd like to add, Bob, as we're closing this program? I don't think I can think of anything new or different at this point, so maybe it is a good time to close. Well, well I want to thank, yes, Donald? I'm just going to ask Bob if I could, if he would share his email as well. Sure. Um, well, please go ahead. I, I think I already shared mine. Well, yes, I have it. Yes, so you can go ahead and share yours before we close the panel. And while Bob is typing his email, I'd like to thank all the participants uh, the people who are actually, uh, who joined this webinar, I also would like to thank all the people who will take time in days and weeks and months ahead to watch this recording, both on YouTube, where it will be available, and on Facebook. And most importantly, I'd like to thank We the World and the wonderful team that made all of this possible, including technically possible. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, We the World. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, in this inspiring journey, 11 days of global unity, let's keep going forward now. This is just the beginning. Thank you all.